Stan Nakata, and Bob Harper. All right, uh, can you hear me? Okay. All right, uh, so I'll tell you about homotopical patch theory. Um, so what, what do I mean by that? Well, basically I mean that uh, I'm going to be talking about doing um, patch theory inside of homotopy type theory using an old idea called functorial semantics. Um, so when I say patch, I mean like uh, patches and version control, stuff like that. But I'll, I'll explain each of these things and then uh, what we did. All right, so functorial semantics. So this idea uh, goes back to the 1960s and uh, Bill LeVere, and uh, basically the idea is that you want to define an equational theory as a uh, functor out of some category that represents that theory. Um, so uh, for groups, um, we, we define a category uh, G, and that sort of tells you what the group um, axioms are, and, and then um, you say that a group itself is a uh, product-preserving functor uh, from G to set. Okay, so uh, the theory of groups um, is a finite product category generated by um, an object called C, which uh, sort of represents the carrier of the group. Uh, and then there's a composition uh, binary operation on, on C. Um, there's a identity um, element for that um, composition, and there's a unary inverse operation. And then certain laws are imposed, like uh, this law says that, um, that identi the identity is a left unit for the composition. Okay, so if we unwrap uh, what a product preserving functor like that is, um, it sort of has three kinds of data associated with it. So the first one says that uh, it tells you how to interpret the carrier. So this is the actual carrier of the actual group. Um, and then the, the morphism part of the functor uh, tells you how to interpret all the operations. So it gives you genuine operations on that carrier. Um, and then the fact that it is a functor, that it uh, respects equality of the morphisms, um, tells you that the group laws are satisfied. So the morphism laws I had before uh, sort of turn into actual group laws. Okay, and uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to kind of think of um, this data as defining a concrete structure in the sense that um, it's a set and some operations on, uh, some functions on it, so it really is something you can kind of run and observe and so on. Okay. So what's homotopy type theory? Um, so basically, it's a constructive proof-relevant theory of equality inside of dependent type theory, sort of as the ambient logic. Um, and the, the main idea is that, um, so in dependent type theory, you have an a, um, equality type. This, uh, I'm writing it A uh, equals B sub X. And that means that um, P is a proof that A equals B in the type X. And, um, you should think of this as the uh, type of identifications of A with B. So don't really think of it as equality because that will lead you astray. Think of it as an identification and it's proof relevant so P might have some data associated with it telling you why A is identified with B. Okay, so um, what things are true about these identifications? Well, it, um, they're reflexive, symmetric, and transitive because you know, we expect equality to be. Um, so, you know, for example, if P is an identification of A with B, then uh, bang P is how I write inverses, um, is an identification of B with A. And uh, so these are called the groupoid operations, and they satisfy groupoid laws, like that the, uh, the REFL here is a unit for the, uh, for the composition, and so on. All right, now, because everything is proof relevant, uh, we can have identifications of these identifications. So what I mean by that is that uh, P and Q are sort of evidence that A can be identified with B, and uh, because there's evidence associated with those, um, it's quite possible to ask, you know, well, are P and Q the same or not? So uh, here we can think of alpha and beta as you know, identifications of P with Q as identifications of uh, A with B in X. Okay, um, and now, the usual case in type theory, or just in logic in general, is that um, it's, it's important to ask whether two things are equal or not. Like, you know, you want to know if two numbers are the same. Um, but if they are the same, there's no, nothing to ask about that equality. If, you know, 5 equals 5 just because it does, not, not because of anything too interesting. So uh, in the case where you have identifications, but there's nothing interesting above that level, um, then uh, that type is called a homotopy set. Uh, and that just basically means like it's, it's a normal type in the sense that there's, uh, there's not really any proof relevance to the equality. 
Okay. Now, functions send equal elements to equal results. Uh, so um, uh, here what that means is that if P identifies A with B and X, then um, I spell it app FP um, identifies mm -hmm. F of A with F of B and Y. Right? And uh, remember, there's, because there's um, structure above just the identifications, you know, there are identifications of those, um, actually all of that structure is preserved. Um, so not just the equalities, but really all the way up, everything is uh, preserved functorially by functions. All right, so because normal uh, type theory just has um, homotopy sets in the sense I was describing, um, we need some way to actually introduce new identifications. So uh, the idea of homotopy type theory is that uh, type theory is consistent with more identifications, but I have to actually add some in. Um, so the first of two mechanisms I'll talk about for doing that are called higher inductive types, which are like inductive types, except that you can uh, throw in generating identifications as well as generating points. Um, so here, the circle is a higher inductive type where um, there's a point in it called base, and there is a uh, identification called loop, which identifies base with base. Now, because of the groupoid laws, um, there is also an identification of ba base with base that's uh, loop composed loop and uh, loop inverse, and so on. Um, so it's, it's not that loop is the only identification, but it generates all of them in some sense. Okay, so what is patch theory? All right, well, so um, the idea is I'm interested in studying uh, repositories and the changes you can make to them, uh, but sort of in the abstract. So a concrete example is um, if you have a single file repository, this is sort of, um, you know, a length and vector of strings is like an mline file. Um, and you might uh, say that the basic patches uh, that you can make are um, to add some string s as line l of the file or to remove the else line of the file. Um, and there are going to be certain um, patch laws that these will satisfy. Like if you add something as the else line and then you remove the else line, that's the same as doing nothing. All right, so what things are going to be true of um, patch theories in general? All right, well, um, uh, for every repository, there's an identity patch that does nothing. Um, if you do a patch, uh, P, you can uh, undo the patch with inverse P. And if you have two uh, patches that you can apply in sequence, you can create a new patch by um, sort of composing the two of them. Right, so, you know, the, basically the groupoid laws again. Um, and uh, moreover, there are going to be certain patch laws that, uh, that hold in all patch theories. So I talked about, you know, add followed by remove does nothing, and that's specific to the idea of add and remove. Um, but in general, it's still going to be the case, for example, that, um, that the identity patch is a right unit for um, the composition of patches, right, and, and things like that. Um, uh, one other thing is that patches don't always apply to every repository. So, you know, you can't remove the fifth line of a file that only has three lines in it. All right, so that will come up later. Okay, so now let me talk about a, um, a simple abstract example. So this is um, trying to write down the kind of the laws that should hold for a certain kind of repository. And um, in this case, it's going to be very simple. It's a repository that is just a, an integer. And the idea is that you can um, add one to that integer. Now, because you have composition and inverses um, in all patch theories, you automatically can also add two, and you can subtract one, and, and so on. Um, so uh, it's generated by add one and the groupoid laws. Those are what the patches are. And then the uh, patch laws are just going to be all the generic ones in this case, like you know, identity is the right unit for composition. OK, so if I want to model these um, abstract patches as a higher inductive type, um, I can do it like this, for example, where I say, all right, um, patch is, uh, is a type, and um, add one is a patch, and the identity patch is a patch, and given two patches, you can compose them, and they're the inverses. Um, and what makes this a higher inductive type, so that's all normal, but I'm going to also say, you know, and it's important that, um, that if you do P and then the identity, that uh, I want to equate these as patches, um, like with P. So um, I'm going to throw in these uh, identification constructors, like unit, unit L here, um, that uh, basically um, are, it's, I'm sort of using higher inductive types as quotient types here. So I'm just uh, saying, you know, these two patches are actually the same. All right, so then what I would want to do is uh, interpret these patches functorially. Uh, so I want to say that a abstract patch induces a genuine patch 
Um, so if I'm thinking of the repository as actually consisting of integers, uh, then um, the path should be something that takes an integer and gives you the new integer. It tells you what to do with the repository. Right, so um, I'll define a function interp here that does that. And it interprets the add one patch as the successor function, and uh, the identity patch as the identity function. And, uh, um, and it interprets composition functorially as uh, function composition and so on. Um, and because functions have to preserve identifications, I also have to show that um, when I define this interp function, that it satisfies all the groupoid laws, like the uh, left unit law. Um, so the thing is, so I just uh, went through a bunch of work for, uh, to uh, make sure that um, the patches were sort of groupoidal and uh, were respected functorially by the, by the um, interpretation. Uh, but I just got through telling you that in homotopy type theory, equality has all those properties, or identifications are those. Um, so I'm going to sort of take advantage of that. And the key idea of the whole paper is that uh, we think of a patch that takes some repository A to a repository B as an identification of A with B. And remember, because it's proof relevant, it's, um, this is, the patch is a reason that you can identify A with B. It's not saying that A and B are exactly the same. All right. So um, if I want to take advantage of the um, uh, homotopy type theory equality, I'll have to model add one as, a, as an identification. So I'll say that num is the abstract repository, and add one is an identification of num with num. And now again, because of the groupoid laws, you automatically have add one compose add one as um, also having type uh, num equals num in R and so on. And so here R, we sort of, it's analogous to the, um, to the category G I was talking about at the beginning, where this is kind of the abstract theory of this particular kind of repository. Um, so I'm going to use functorial semantics and I'll map out of it into sets. Uh, so here, capital I is this uh, sort of interpretation functor. And uh, the idea is, well, um, I have to sort of find the same structure in I, in set that uh, there is in R. Um, so I'm going to interpret the abstract repository num concretely as the type int. Um, and uh, so therefore, because we respect uh, identifications, I have to um, interpret the add one identification as an identification of int with int. Okay, so now the question is, well, what is an identification of a type with some other type in, in the type of all sets? Well, uh, so the second way we're going to add identifications into type theory is um, called the univalence axiom. And this says that uh, every time you have a bijection between sets X and Y, um, that this uh, generates an identification uh, of X with Y in the universe of sets. Um, so in particular, in this case, uh, because the successor function is a bijection on integers, um, univalence applied to that is uh, going to be an identification of int with int. Okay, and uh, remember, it's proof relevant, so I'm not saying that int, well, in this case, int is the same as int, but if they weren't actually the same, it's, uh, it's not that I'm saying that uh, is uh, uh, isomorphic sets are literally the same, I'm saying that they're identified by some fact. Okay, so uh, now unpacking this, what does, um, what does I do? Well, there are basically three parts, as with the uh, functorial semantics. So the first part, uh, what I does on elements of R, um, tells us that the abstract repository is interpreted concretely as int. The second part, which uh, is that I respects equality, um, says that we interpret the abstract operation add one as a concrete function successor. And the third part, um, which we get for free, is that uh, because uh, the group word laws hold for um, equalities, uh, that I automatically has to respect other group word laws. So this interpretation has to be functorial. It's guaranteed uh, just by the nature of functions inside the theory. Okay, so all that actually worked out pretty well. Maybe uh, you don't realize that, but uh, every you know nothing really uh, went wrong. Everything was uh, pretty clean there. Uh, but uh, there's sort of it gets harder. Um, so what I'm going to do is. Um, just make a very small change. Instead of talking about integers and uh, adding to them, um, instead I'm going to say, well, what if the repository was a natural number? And I want to talk about uh, the patches you can do are just um, adding one, as before, um, and the uh, normal group word laws have to be satisfied. So the obvious thing to do to model this uh, would be to write down, well, exactly what I just did write down. Uh, you know, there's a num, 
uh, which is the repository, and then you can add one, and there's automatically uh, uh, the group-wide operations associated with that. The problem is um, that, you know, last time we got inverses completely for free, so here we get inverses completely for free also, um, and that's troubling because you can't always subtract one from a natural number, right? Um, uh, you always have inverses, but um, in the model, you actually don't always have inverses. You can't subtract one from zero, um, and the, uh, the theory kind of uh, requires that you be able to. Um, so the solution here is to index the, um, uh, the points of R, the patch contexts, to characterize when patches can apply. So uh, basically, because um, inverses flip the direction of the equality, um, in order to have a bad path that starts um, that starts at zero and, and goes left, um, you have to have uh, uh, had a um, a patch that ended at zero, right? And uh, it, and here in this case, uh, that's not possible because we're basically characterizing um, add one always takes you to a larger number, so you can only go backwards if there is a number you can subtract away again. Okay, so I star here is the theory. Um, and how do we interpret it functorially? Uh, well, the obvious thing to do is say, well, forget about you know, what I just did, and I'm just going to interpret every doc n um, as the natural numbers. Okay, the problem with this is that uh, the successor function isn't a bijection on natural numbers. Actually, that's exactly what I just got through saying. Um, so univalence doesn't uh, give you an identification of nat with nat by the successor function. Right, so actually, uh, the fix is going to be that uh, we interpret every dot n point as the singleton type of n, uh, which is just uh, a type that only contains n, n in it, essentially. Um, and so um, I, if I interpret dot n as um, singleton of n, then I need to interpret, uh, for example, add one here from dot zero to dot one as a bijection between singleton of zero and singleton of one. But uh, these are both one element sets, so they're um, there is a bijection there. Uh, so everything works out, and it's great. Okay, so uh, what's, what's the rest of the paper about? Well, um, there's a lot more about uh, um, uh, interpreting these non-invertible patches. Like, uh, you know, in, in most cases, the patches aren't going to be invertible, the things that you do to a repository. So we, we have to grapple with that. Um, there, we talk about fancier patch theories with fancier patch laws. Um, the idea is the same, but it gets just a lot more complicated. Um, like the example I told you at the beginning with um, n-line files and add and remove is kind of the key example in the paper that we developed. Um, and uh, we also define functions that actually do stuff with the patches. So I didn't really ever do anything except interpret them, uh, but you can uh, do things like say, I want to optimize the sequence of patches. If I add one, then subtract one, I want to optimize that away as doing nothing. So you can define functions that, uh, that perform that for you. Um, and you can also define merge functions. So if you have a repository and you have two divergent patches to it, um, how do you compute uh, um, another pair of patches that, <coughs> that merge them back together? Um, so if you're interested in the paper, we recommend that you um, go to one of the author's websites or um, this link right here. There's an expanded version of the paper that has several pages at the end of extra exposition um, that helps sort of contextualize the, the more difficult parts of the paper. Um, so we think that it will be easier to read. Um, the, the thing I want to leave you with um, just is the idea that there's sort of a tension here between the computation and the homotopy or the, the identifications in that um, on the one hand, I'm saying that I want to identify a whole bunch of terms using identifications, and I even want to identify um, isomorphic sets as equal. Uh, but on the other hand, computation is all about distinguishing things. Or you want to you know, tell numbers apart, because that's how uh, computing works. Um, but somehow there's, a, there's sort of a contradiction here in that I'm, I'm identifying doc0 and doc1 in, in I star, but at the same time, I want to send them to different things. I mean, they're isomorphic things, but still. Um, so what's, what's the deal? All right, and uh, we actually think it's a lot like um, function extensionality. So the idea that you might want to throw into your type theory the fact that if two functions do the same thing on all arguments, that you can want to consider them equal. All right, now, what that means is, for example, a bubble sort and quick sort become equal. We say that they're equal, but as computer scientists, we care a lot about the fact that they're not the same, I mean, they're, they're very different. Right, um, uh, sort of as computer scientists, even if they aren't as mathematicians. 
Um, so the idea is that they're, they're the same mathematical function, but they're very different programs, and they compute in different ways. And it shouldn't be surprising that something, two things that are equal still compute in very different ways. Right? And so our, the idea is that uh, you should just think of computation as finer grained than, um, than the internal quality. All right, thanks. Bill Wagner, University of Edinburgh. I think that's the first time I've seen a talk on homotopy type theory where I understood everything that was said. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> that was our hope. The trouble is, <laughs> what I understand is, okay, we can define the natural numbers. I knew that before. So the thing that I need from a talk on homotopy type theory that I've not had yet, and I'm wondering if you can provide it from the rest of the paper somewhere, is um, something that, once I've seen it, I go, oh yeah, okay, I didn't need homotopy type theory to see that. But the homotopy type theory is telling me how to look at it to see that. Right? Having seen it, you can go back and go, oh, no, I could have seen that another way. But it's the principles of homotopy type theory that are leading me to see that particular thing that I wouldn't have seen some other way. Mm. Right? That's how category theory helped with monads. Oh. Right? People would come over and say, I don't need cut category theory to do that. And they're right. You don't. But the category theory guided us to get there. So can you give me an example of that from homotopy type theory? Um, well, kind of the core example of the, the paper is, you know, the idea of functorial semantics, right? So we, we started off by um, trying to kind of do what a Dark's patch theory did. Um, and it turned out that didn't exactly work, but uh, we did, you know, some uh, similar idea. And already there, there's a, a very natural is the idea that you want to interpret things functorially. Like you want to interpret compositions of patches the same way you interpret each patch composed. And, and so on. And that, so that's, I think, a very natural idea in computer science. And of course, the entire idea of equational theories is, you know, uh, basically functorial semantics. So, um, you know, the, the idea here is that we get to um, do that without writing all of it down, right? The, the functorial part is sort of automatic, um, right? Uh, so it's, it's something you could have written down, like when I wrote down the, the patch type as a quotient type and then the interp function with the with the laws, and that, that all already works in normal type theory um, with quotient types, but this is sort of, you can do that and you can get everything for free. You get the groupoid operations and the groupoid laws for free. Okay, does that? But I knew oh. those laws before. There, there's one thing that you said there that I think could lead to an exposition of this kind, which is that the dark theory was almost right, mm -hmm. and by looking at it through the lens of homotopy type theory, you could get it actually right. Did, yeah, did, did well, I catch that properly? Yeah, yeah. I'm all, I mean, so I'm, what I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying that you know that it it sort of did things that were not completely functorial. Like there's some it, you know it can sort of distinguish between whether a patch is forward or backward. And in you know homotopy type theory, you're sort of not allowed to do that because then you could um, you, know, you could sort of break functoriality. Um, and so there are ideas like that that. Um, you know, it's a very rigid discipline here where you, everything you do has to be sort of completely functorial and, and stuff like that. Okay, well, yeah. I'll let other people ask questions, okay. but I'll leave with you the idea of um, identifying those places where homotopy type theory gives you a nice insight yeah. that you can then reflect back to us mortals. And if you explain where the insight came from, that will motivate the rest of us to learn it. Sure, thanks. Andreas Abel Loka. So as you mentioned, darks, um, there's a nice feature of darks that you have patch commutation. Does your theory say uh, something about that? Or? Uh, yeah, th so actually, um, we started off by trying to define um, patch commutation and then define merge in terms of that and stuff. But it didn't really work out. In, um, and it's, it's a little complicated to explain why. But basically, um, when, you, uh, when you want to define a function, that sort of inspects very closely um, a sequence of patches. Uh, you sort of have to define an, induct uh, an induction principle on the identity type. 
um, which basically involves proving a mathematical theorem about how the um, about about the structure of that type. Like these are sort of actually interesting and important mathematical theorems. So it's it's sort of not the thing that you naturally want to do, and um, it's sort of uh, harder. It also um, uh, we also felt like there were situations where it mattered. You had to be able to tell, as I was just saying, whether uh, something was a composition of patches, because if it was a composition of patches, you sort of broke it down into a tiling, you know, some uh, some commutations, and so on. So it, it we felt like it didn't quite match up with the completely functorial nature of hot. But uh, yeah, I mean we can talk more about that if you want. Hello, uh, Edward Yang from Stanford University. Um, so one of the things that I found a bit puzzling uh, was when you were defining the interpretation function on the natural number repository. Yeah. Um, so when you did it for integers, you said, oh, well, you in interpret an integer as a integer. And I was like, OK, sure, right, that would be the way I do it. And now you say, OK, I'm going to interpret a natural number as you know this singleton thing. And now I'm thinking, OK, well, certainly this is motivated by the homotopy type theory because you need functoriality, but I don't understand what that type means. Can you give me some intuition about it? Um, yeah, so this is basically just a complete hack. Um, that, uh, <laughs> where the, the problem is, like, like I was saying, uh, because, um, because univalence requires you to have bijections, uh, you sort of have to do this in order to make things a, bi a bijection. Like, a successor isn't a bijection, but uh, if you restrict it to singletons, it is a bijection. So really, I think what's going on here and the intuition is that um, homotopy type theory is sort of, for computer science purposes, what we really want is a directed type of identification that doesn't have symmetry. And because uh, we talk a lot about directed processes. And if you um, don't have symmetry, then this kind of thing doesn't happen because you're not forced to be able to invert absolutely everything. Okay, great. Right. Uh, last question. Yeah. Oh, hi, So. I found, I found your uh, shallow embedding on both like, um, patches and identifications very nice. Can you uh, highlight a bit where the higher structure plays a role with uh, patches? Uh, right. So in the in the sort of deeper embedding. I mean. No, in, in, in the shallow we have we have identifications of identifications of identifications. So where does that uh, even higher? Do you mean this one or or no? You no. mean what I did most? The shallow one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that basically is giving you all of the uh, functoriality for free. Um, so in, in this case, because we're interpreting them as sets. Yeah, but that's just um, the first layer. I'm well, the second, the second layer. The second layer, so yeah, yeah, yeah. the third, fourth, fifth, because that's yeah. So we're not sure what the third layer is sort of for um, for CS. Uh, but here, um, because, because we're interpreting things as sets, it's sort of the second layer matters, but not above that. Um, and uh, so if there was a situation where you wanted to do functorial semantics into groupoids or something, then the third layer would also matter. So think, you know, if we can find an example like that, then that will basically answer the question. Thanks, thank Carl. Speaker is uh, Jesper Cox, who will be telling us about pattern matching without K. Okay. Um, yeah. uh, so uh, you probably all know uh, pattern matching from uh, functional languages, like, uh, for example, Haskell or ML. And uh, some of you also may know uh, dependent pattern matching. Uh, so it's uh, it's big brother, and it's used to define uh, functions and proofs in uh, languages based on dependent type theory, such as Agda or Idris. 
or Coke also. Um, and uh, well, it's a very powerful way uh, to write these programs and proofs, yet it's uh, still readable. So uh, well, it makes it very useful. Um, uh, however, in recent years we have seen the development of uh, new type theories such as homotopy type theory and um, the, the problem is that they are incompatible with uh, this dependent pattern matching and this makes it, well, uh, this makes, uh, forces people working on homotopy type theory to not use this uh, dependent pattern matching, which is a shame. Uh, and the source of this incompatibility is that uh, dependent pattern matching depends on this uh, axiom called uh, K-axiom, uh, which is also known as the uniqueness of identity proofs. And um, fortunately, uh, not all definitions by dependent pattern matching uh, actually rely on this K-axiom. So uh, the main question becomes then, how can, can we recognize which definitions do depend on this k axiom and which don't? And uh, the answer I'm trying to explain in this talk is uh, that we can do so by taking into account the identity proofs that are uh, used during the unification of these indices. Uh, so how does this talk look like? Well, let me first explain something uh, basics about dependent pattern matching and how it's related to this k axiom. <laughs> Uh, secondly, I'll ta uh, give my proposal for the criterion, how we can avoid this k axiom. And finally, I'll give a few details about um, parts of the proof uh, that I gave for the soundness of this criterion. Right, so, let's start with uh, some uh, simple pattern matching that we all know from uh, Haskell or Anna. Uh, so we have a data type with a uh, number of constructors, for example, natural numbers, and uh, we want to define a function on it, for example, uh, the minimum of the two numbers. So we can do so by um, making case splits, so uh, making distinctions, and then filling in the right-hand side. Uh, so each equation here is called a clause of the definition. Um, yeah, and so left-hand side is a pattern, the right-hand side is just called the right-hand side. <laughs> um, so what changes when we go to dependent pattern matching? Well, the basic thing that changes is that we don't have just a regular inductive type, but an inductive family of types, which are indexed by some base type. Uh, for example, we can have a data type of proofs that one natural number is less or equal than the other. And uh, there are two basic ways of proving this. Well, first one is just zero is less or equal than any natural number. And uh, the second one says that as if x is less or equal than y, then the successors are also uh, less or equal. Um, so these are the two constructors of this uh, data type. And then we might want to prove something about this. For example, that it is anti-symmetric, so that if x is less than or equal to y, and uh, conversely also, then they must be equal. And um, so if you want to prove this, we can do basically the same thing. So make a case distinction, for example, on this proof P. Um, and uh, so we get two cases, one for each constructor. Uh, but the new thing here is that now by pattern matching, we learn something about uh, the first two arguments, namely what's given in the type. Um, and, and we write this by uh, writing these lower brackets. Um, where th these are called inaccessible patterns. Um, yeah. And uh, the second thing that's new is, well, uh, now that we know, uh, in the first case, for example, that uh, x must be 0, uh, this constrains the constructors that we can use for the second argument. Uh, because, well, uh, we can use the first constructor for this argument, but not the second one, because it requires the argument to be a successor. So uh, dependent pattern matching here allows us to rule out some of the cases that would be impossible because of the types. And uh, similarly, for the second case there, we can only have the second constructor. Uh, and this allows us to finish the proof by making a cursive call and apply congruence. 
Now, uh, in a language with dependent types, but without pattern matching, uh, this proof would look like this. Uh, so, uh, it's quite more complicated. Uh, we can still see some parts of the proof. For example, the ilim less than equal corresponds to the case split. But uh, there's a lot of extra work we need to do uh, to finish this proof. So, um, one uh, very special type in uh, type theory is the identity type. Uh, and, but it can also be defined as a, an inductive family with just one constructor that proves uh, reflexivity, basically. And uh, from just this uh, definition, we can, for example, prove that uh, it is transitive. And in order to do this, we can also use pattern matching. So, uh, yeah. Uh, you can just pattern match on the proof of reflexivity and uh, see that, well, yeah, if you, if you have x equals uh, uh, equal to y and y equal to z, then x equals to z. And uh, if you think about this in terms of the previous presentation, then this, this is just a composition of two patches. So this might help you. Uh, however, pattern matching also allows us to prove some other stuff, for example, the infamous k axiom. Um, and uh, basically says if you want to prove something about the proof of A equals A, then it suffices to prove it just for reflexivity. In other words, the only proof of A equals A is uh, exactly this reflexivity proof. And uh, this uh, is not something we want in homotopy type theory. Uh, uh, well, for example, again, in terms of the previous presentation, it was, it was say that there are no non-trivial patches. The only patch is the uh, identity patch. So this would make the theory not very interesting. Um, so and, and actually, it also makes our uh, theory inconsistent if combined with uh, axioms from homotopy type theory, such as the univalence. Um, well, uh, to see this, uh, you can see that uh, if you have a proof of bool equals bool, then k allows us to prove that any uh, that, that uh, coercing any element of bool by this proof just gives us back this element, while uh, univalence allows us to uh, prove bool equals bool by swapping the two elements of bool. So if you coerce by this proof, then true becomes false. And uh, those, those two facts together give us that true, true equals false, which uh, makes the entire theory inconsistent. So, um, we clearly want some way to allow definitions like uh, the anti-symmetry or the transitivity while disallowing the definition of K. So we have to think about what's the difference between those two uh, definitions. Uh, and um, in order to do this, we have to look at how these um, indices are handled uh, when we pattern match on the constructor of an inductive family. And the way this is done uh, is by uh, unification. So if we pattern match on an argument of some inductive uh, which has a type of an inductive family, then the indices of this element are unified with the indices of the constructor. And uh, this uh, unification algorithm is actually not very complicated. It's a simple first order unification. Uh, so it has five rules. Uh, if we have a reflexive equation, we can delete it. Uh, if we have a variable, one side does, doesn't occur on the other, then we can just solve this equation. Uh, we have injectivity and disjointness of uh, constructors. And finally, if there's a cycle, so for example, if n equals the successor of n, then we can also discard. Uh, uh, we can also say that this is an impossible case so we can just skip that case in the definition. Uh, so um, what, uh, what, what I done is, is looked at these rules and, uh, uh, and um, sorry. just uh, see which one of them are still allowed if we are in a theory without k. And it turns out that with two basic instructions to this algorithm that we can avoid using the k axiom. So uh, the first restriction is that we cannot use the first rule to delete reflexive equations because this would exactly require the k axiom to do this. And uh, the second one is a little more subtle. 
but uh, it basically requires when we have uh, when, to, when we want to apply injectivity uh, to an equation well with two the same constructors and these constructors are constructors of an inductive family then uh, it requires the indices of this inductive family to be unifiable with themselves this sounds like a strange restriction isn't anything unifiable with itself but uh, exactly because of the first restriction this is not true anymore um, so uh, let me show a very simple example um, so suppose you want to prove that any proof of a equals a equals reflexivity and we want to do this by pattern matching on this first proof um, uh, then uh, well, we cannot do this because uh, this uh, pattern matching on this proof requires exactly the deletion rule. So uh, this uh, already rules out this example. Uh, the second rule, well, uh, suppose we're not having any proof of A equals A, but a very specific case where A is also a reflexivity proof. So now we're one level higher. Uh, then, then the injectivity rule uh, would allow us uh, to uh, just discard this equation, raffle equals raffle, and uh, would allow this proof to go through. Yet, uh, this type would actually say that, well, again, in terms of the previous presentation, would say that, well, yes, there are interesting patches, but there are no interesting patch laws. This, uh, so this would also uh, make the theory, well, much less interesting. So uh, this is why we need a second restriction on the unification algorithm. Um, so uh, this, uh, uh, as you can see, this has been uh, implemented in uh, Agda. And uh, so you can put an option at, at the top of your Agda file uh, without K. And then it actually gives uh, you an error message like this if you try to enter this definition. And uh, it has been released uh, as uh, part of Agda 2.4, so you can try it out if you want. Uh, so for the rest of this talk, I'll say a few words about uh, part of the soundness proof for this uh, criterion. And um, uh, yeah, so and I think this uh, this specific part is interesting because it also shows a more general pattern that occurs when uh, you have a proof uh, about something in type theory and want to update it to homotopy type theory. So um, let's see, so uh, the general proof of uh, soundness for a criterion is based on the one given by uh, Conor McBride in uh, his thesis. And uh, the structure is basically in three steps. So um, what does this proof do? Well, it's uh, step by step, it translates a definition by pattern matching to one uh, using only the basic eliminators, like the one uh, I showed uh, for the anti-symmetry. Uh, so the, <coughs> the first step is uh, to translate each case split in the definition to an application of an eliminator. Uh, this is called the basic case analysis. Uh, doing this basic case analysis generates a number of equations on the indices. So these equations have to be solved by uh, applying the unification algorithm. And uh, finally, we arrive at some base case, and then we have the right hand side, which may contain recursive calls. So we have to fill in these recursive calls by doing uh, structural induction. Uh, and uh, the challenge of the proof is then to uh, construct each of these tools as terms in, in type theory. Uh, so type theory without pattern matching and without k axiom. Um, and uh, yeah. So uh, I will now focus on the second step, this uh, unification algorithm. And uh, each of the unification steps will become a function that uh, simplifies uh, the equation that we get. Uh, but before we can even write this in type theory, we have to think about how we can we uh, represent equations inside type theory. And uh, especially when we have multiple equations where the type of the later equations depends on the values of the former equation. Uh, this is a problem because then the types of later arguments might not be equal, or at least not syntactically equal. 
And uh, the way uh, Wright uh, solved this is uh, by using heterogeneous equality. So um, by uh, allowing equations between elements of different types, um, but still only allowing to prove it, of course, when they're actually equal. Um, and the problem with this is that the elimination rule for this uh, heterogeneous equality ex is equivalent with the kx here. Um, so my alternative to this was to uh, instead use the homogeneous equality, and, uh, but use the equalities uh, of the previous elements in the sequence to fix the types of the later ones. Because we know that the type should be equal, uh, we can fix it by just substituting the first proof into the second equation. And um, by doing this, well, uh, you basically get an upgraded version of all the unification rules uh, where we now have also have to keep track of all these uh, equality proofs. So, uh, for example, for the deletion rule, uh, well, the innocent looking deletion rule, suddenly if we keep track of the equality proofs, uh, becomes well, exactly the K axiom. So, uh, this shows very clearly why we cannot allow it. Um, second rule is the solution rule. So um, in this case, uh, it's actually equivalent with the standard eliminator for the homogeneous equality. So it's fine; we can allow it. Um, the third rule is injectivity rule. Um, so uh, here, by keeping track of this equality proof, we can see that there is an additional side condition needed. Um, I won't go into detail now because I don't have much time. And uh, finally, there's the conflict rule and the cycle rule, which basically stay as uh, before. So um, a few possible uh, possibilities for future work. Uh, um, well, extending this uh, criterion to be more liberal or allowing more good definitions. Um, so right now it's a little uh, conservative still. So for, uh, one possibility would be to try uh, uh, types that actually satisfy this k-axiom, for example, natural numbers. Well, there are no non-trivial proofs uh, that 2 equals 2, clearly, so uh, should, we should be allowed to delete an equation of uh, 2 equals 2. Uh, right now, this is not the case. Um, second one is uh, implementing uh, this translation to eliminators. So right now, it's just a check that checks if this translation is in, uh, possible in theory, but would be uh, give us more confidence in the program if this translation was actually done. And uh, actually, these two points uh, are uh, already being handled, I think, uh, in the new version of the equations package for Koch. But uh, as far as I know, it hasn't been released yet. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, well, the biggest question here is, of course, this gives us better matching on regular inductive types and families, but what about uh, higher inductive types? And well, I don't really have a clear answer to that yet. Uh, so uh, to conclude, um, so uh, by restricting this uh, unification algorithm, we, uh, we have been able to make uh, pattern matching work in a context where we don't have this k axiom, uh, so um, uh, so you don't uh, you no longer have to worry when using pattern matching, even in uh, homotopy type theory. So uh, if you want to know more about the proof, you can read the paper, or if you trust me and you just want to use it, just download the new version of Agda and try it out. Thank you. experience contributing an actual implementation to like that? Um, so uh, it took some time to get uh, acquainted with the code base of Agda, but actually once I understood how everything worked, it was not, not a big change. I mean, the unification algorithm has to be restricted, so uh, it was basically just uh, removing a few lines. <laughs> <And> <laughs> And uh, well, yeah, okay, applying this uh, check for, for the injectivity, 
uh, took a little more, but <laughs> it was, was not too hard. Could you go back to the slide where um, you proved false equals true? Okay, so I believe that proving false equals true is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, and the way you wanted to fix it was by getting rid of k. Mm -hmm. But I wondered if there was a different way of fixing it, which is um, the way in which you got into trouble was uh, your definition of um, the triple equals relation. So if you could go back to the inductive definition for that. Yeah, there it is. So this says there's exactly one way to prove two things are equal, mm -hmm. which is raffle. And the reason that you got into trouble was that you had two ways of proving bool equals bool, one of which was raffle and one of which was swap. Mm -hmm. So maybe the problem is not k, maybe the problem is this definition. And, and by the way, I'm, I'm sure that this is a really stupid question because I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so um, the problem is, yes, you could give an alternative definition to equality, not as um, an inductive type, but just as a primitive in the type theory. But um, the problem is we still want the same uh, eliminator for the for this equality. This is called the J rule. And um, as soon as you have this rule, it becomes uh, provable that, in fact, the other identity type you just defined is uh, equivalent to this one. So, so and, and, and because we have K for this one, uh, this would also transfer k to your new definition. So uh, there's really this k axiom is really not just contained to the identity type, which is something that infects the entire theory as soon as you have it. Okay, so it, it, it's harder than just saying just don't do that. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, I had a quick question. So, uh, the um, uh, you said the criterion is somewhat conservative. Mm -hmm. uh, so, have you actually tried um, uh, recompiling uh, a bunch of Agda libraries that use dependent pattern matching and seeing how many of them still work with yeah, without K turn? I did. Uh, so, uh, most of the libraries uh, that are currently written are not uh, written with this without K option in mind. So, uh, they obviously they keep working if you don't enter the without k option. But uh, I also tried just enabling this without k option naively uh, on the Agda library. And well, uh, actually have some slides on this. And, uh, so um, there were, uh, in total, I had uh, 36 errors on the entire standard library of Agda, which is fairly large. So uh, 16 of these would be uh, clearly fixable in an easy way if you, for example, had this uh, first extension that uh, detects when a type satisfies K. And uh, well, the other 20 are either, uh, well, <laughs> clearly unfixable because uh, they are equivalent with K or uh, quite unknown because, well, for example, some of them have to do with uh, code data types and I really don't know how uh, co-inductive types interact with uh, k axiom, so I'm not sure about that. But most parts of the library actually keep working fine. And, uh, yeah. uh, so uh, I kind of have a follow-up question. To them. If you uh, use without k in uh, your uh, old file but still depend on uh, standard library, mm -hmm. then won't you run into trouble because uh, the standard library yeah, all the has something equivalent to K, mm -hmm. so your entire pro uh, program still derives K? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. So if you want to use this without K option, then all the libraries you're using also have to use this without K option. Uh, is, uh, could uh, this option uh, be modified to require that all, uh, everything that depends on uh, is also without K? Um, yes, I think it would be not very hard. 
Yeah, let's find Jesper. The next session starts in uh, 15 minutes.